Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. Now if you've seen the channel before, you've probably seen me use this thing and a few people have asked about it in the comments section. So today we're going to have a look at what this little LCD panel is and how you can build one yourself. So what we have here is an 8 inch 4x3 LCD panel and it's hooked up to this thing here which is an LCD driver board. This accepts a bunch of different inputs and spits out something that the LCD panel can recognize. What I usually use this for is just testing out different systems just to see if they're putting out a video signal and potentially audio as well. And it did take me a little while to settle on this kind of design. As you can see, it's kind of janky, um, but it actually does a pretty good job. There is some other things you can get like these little guys here. This is like a four inch display and it's designed to be used in a car. So it runs off 12 volts and it literally only has composite video input. And I guess there's a secondary input for like a reversing camera. Let's just have a look at this first because we can see the downsides of one of these and then uh, we'll take a look at the upsides of my uh, little crazy creation. So plugging into 12 volts, we just get no signal and feeding it a composite video signal, it should, there we go. So yes, it is a very tiny screen. The off viewing angle is terrible. On the camera, it looks great, but the angle that I'm looking at it at, it looks terrible. Let me give you an example. That's kind of what I'm seeing at the moment. So um, yeah, not great viewing angles and uh, it is quite difficult to read. <laughs> There's also not many menu options to play with. We literally get brightness, contrast, saturation, tint, because it's an NTSC signal coming in, and a language option. I think that is literally all that you can change. Oh, and you can stretch it out to 16 by nine if you like. But yeah, that is literally all this thing does. It is a composite display and a pretty crappy one at that. So when that didn't work out, I stepped up to this thing. It is a bigger display. Uh, again, it runs off 12 volts and is designed to be in a car and it only has composite video as well. The biggest issue with this one, I don't know if you can see that, but it is jittery. It's got the coffee shakes. Um, it looks absolutely terrible. It's actually even harder to read than that tiny one, even though this is a bigger screen because um, the text is just bouncing around all over the place. And again, off viewing angles are probably even worse than the really tiny one. So um, yeah, avoid both this and this. Um, these are just junk, basically. What isn't junk, however, is the quality of PCBs from PCBWay. Ordering from PCBWay is simple. Just upload your Gerber files, select the options and go through the checkout. And thanks to their fast turnaround, you'll have PCBs in your hand before you know it. We thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. So that brings us back to this setup. Now, although this is also supposed to work off 12 volts, I actually found the other day that you can run it quite easily off 5 volts. So with just a USB power bank and a USB to DC barrel cable, um, it will happily run off 5 volts. It does draw about 1 amp at 5 volts, so um, you need a at least a half decent uh, USB power supply, but it will happily run at five volts. So it also makes this thing pretty portable in case you want to test stuff out on the road or around the house, I don't know. Again, we have a composite video input, but the beauty of this is it also has audio inputs, uh, VGA, HDMI, and an analog RF tuner. So it's kind of the perfect all-rounder for testing out uh, retro gear. So before we get into how to build one of these, let's just run through the features and that way you can decide if you wanna go ahead and try and make one of your own. So it does have a little keypad that you can use to control the basic functions, but there is also a remote with this thing, which uh, is a lot easier and a lot more intuitive. Um, so this is the video display just coming through composite video and it looks okay, but the good thing about this is the setup menu has a lot of different options. So we can adjust picture settings, sound settings, uh, clock settings and sleep timers. There's also some OSD settings in here and you can even lock all those settings if you really wanted to. 
So uh, let me just quickly do a little adjustment to the picture settings just so it doesn't look so horrid. Right, and that looks much better. So even on a little display like this, I still like to set it up so it at least looks half decent. Let's have a look at how it handles some of these 240p signals because a lot of old computers, well, especially old video game consoles, will only put out a 240p signal and a lot of modern displays will not handle it correctly. And unfortunately, this one is no exception. So although it's not jittering all over the place like the other display, it also doesn't handle 240p correctly. It tries to deinterlace it. Um, so this little moving object here should be a fairly solid set of horizontal lines. So it doesn't handle 240p correctly, but again, I just use this thing for testing. So not a big deal. In terms of lag, it's saying about four frames of lag, which is probably about right. In terms of audio, it is not very loud at all, but keep in mind that I only have tiny little laptop speakers hooked up to this. So you could potentially hook up a decent set of speakers, but I don't think the amplification circuit in this is gonna drive them very hard. Um, again, there are some settings in the menus, but even adjusting these, I really doubt I'm gonna get much uh, hi-fi audio from this thing. As I mentioned, there is also an analog RF tuner, so let's switch to that. Obviously something like this will come in handy for say an Atari 2600 that only does analog RF output. Cool, and that's what we get from analog RF. So yeah, it works perfectly fine. And this is a Super Famicom system, so it's NTSC. I don't know what frequency it puts out RF at, but we managed to tune it in. And I've also tested it with a bunch of other PAL systems and other NTSC systems. And yeah, everything's managed to tune in just fine. So yeah, handy to have a little analog tuner sometimes. Now, of course, one of the systems that I'm often testing are Commodore 64s. And the neat little thing about this is I can actually adjust the overscan by jumping into the service menu. You hit menu 2580. That'll get you into the service menu. And then I like to bring the overscan, if I can remember how to do it. I like to bring the horizontal right down so I can see that vertical line on the side there. That's generated by the VIC-2. So if you've got say a Commodore 64 that is giving you a black screen, you can still get that vertical line to show up from the VIC-2. So it does help a little bit in troubleshooting because that way you know the VIC-2 is actually putting out a valid video signal. Of course, there are a bunch of other options in the service menu and it's probably possible to brick this thing if you go changing the wrong stuff. So uh, be wary of that and yeah, to exit the service menu, you just hit exit on the remote, but yeah, menu 2580 will, should get you into the service menu on these things. While we're here, we'll have a quick look at the VGA input. It does look rather dark at the moment. I might just bring up the brightness a little bit on the contrast. Right, that's a bit better. So at the moment, it is receiving a 1024 by 768 signal at 75 hertz, so we know that works. Let's just have a look at a couple of other different video display modes. So that's interesting. Windows is actually saying it's sending it 800 by 600, but if I hit the display button on the remote, 1024 by 768. And it looks like that is 1024 by 768. And the little info on the actual display is lying because uh, the screen size changes quite a bit when I swap between modes. But yeah, text is sharp. There's no odd sort of pixels being scaled anywhere and um, seems to do the job just fine. Yep, works at 70 hertz, works at 60 hertz. That's probably to be expected. It definitely looks a little bit blurrier at 800 by 600. So. Because this is a 1024 by 768 screen, um, yeah, sending it the non-native resolution is always gonna introduce a bit of blur. Yep, it is happy at 72 hertz. So I don't currently have an older system that I can test out lower resolutions like 640 by 480 and 640 by 400 and 
you know, weird refresh rates, but I imagine if it handles, you know, 72 and 75 and 60 hertz and all that, I imagine it's probably going to be okay with those uh, older resolutions and refresh rates as well. While we're at it, we'll just check out HDMI. So this is HDMI at 1920 by 1080 and uh, 60 hertz and it's still, you can still read it. Um, it doesn't look great because this panel doesn't go up to that kind of high resolution, but it's half decent. Funnily enough, sending it 1024 by 68, which is a four by three pixel aspect, uh, it actually pushes it in from the sides. And there doesn't seem to be an obvious way to correct that. So yeah, a little bit funny when it comes to HDMI, but again, I'm really using this for older stuff anyway. It actually probably looks best at 1280 by 720. <laughs> and yeah, 60 or 50 hertz over HDMI seems to work fine. I don't have an option for 24 hertz, so don't know if it works with that or not. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go. 1080p at 24 hertz, and yes, it is definitely at 24 hertz because mouse is not so smooth. Yeah, 30 hertz, I imagine 29.97 is going to work. So yeah, pretty capable HDMI, uh, but the scaling may not work out in your favor. Lastly, there is a USB port, so I know it can handle like JPEG images. Pretty sure it can handle music files and possibly some video files, but I imagine you're probably gonna run into format trouble depending on how your video, you know, what container it's in and how it's encoded, all that kind of thing. So that's about everything that this thing can do. I mean, there might be some other stuff that I just don't know about. So uh, let's go over how to actually put one of these together. First thing you're gonna need is the LCD driver board. This particular one is called a V29, and uh, there are quite a few different ones on AliExpress that have similar model numbers. Sometimes I see the same model number used to describe two different boards. So uh, uh, yeah, be wary on AliExpress. Um, a lot of the time, you never know what you're gonna actually receive. But uh, this is the one that I use. You can tell it apart from most of the rest because it has this electrolytic cap on the end here. One of the other ones I did test out actually has two composite video inputs. This one actually doubles as a component video input, but I never had much success with this board. I think it's called a 3663, or sometimes it's called a V56. Again, they seem to chop and change model numbers depending on the seller. It was partially working, but the sound wasn't working. And then I managed to flash the wrong firmware to it and uh, well, that didn't go so well. Uh, so I kind of bricked this thing. I mean, it might be possible to resurrect it, but these are like 20 bucks and it'll probably take me, you know, a few hours to figure it out. So is it really worth it? And it wasn't working properly in the first place. So then it might've already had an issue. The other one I had is this one. It just has composite video, VGA and HDMI. This is the board that actually came with this screen. Um, but this is terrible. It had those same sort of jittery issues with the composite input, like the uh, cheapo car display. So yeah, probably avoid this one as well. So yeah, this is the LCD driver board that I'd recommend. I'll leave links to all these things in the video description. Um, I don't know if you're gonna get the exact same thing that you see on AliExpress or whatever, um, but yeah, I'll try and link the right things, but don't blame me if the wrong thing shows up. The other thing you wanna look for is this keypad. It has some basic functions like power on and off. Uh, you can change the video inputs. Like I said, I usually use the remote, but you will need part of this because it does have the infrared receiver on it. This is actually two boards that you can separate in the middle there. So you could just hook up the IR receiver and leave the keypad off, but I like to have both just there, just in case. The other thing you'll probably wanna get is little speakers. I've linked some different ones below in the video description that are slightly bigger than this. So they should actually fit a little bit better in these side parts. But yeah, I just use some old crappy laptop speakers and just kind of glued them in place. They also hook up on this driver board to this connector here. Um, the keypad stuff hooks up to this white connector 
And then finally this pin header here is where the LCD panel connects to. You will also notice there is a little jumper on these boards and you want to set that to 5 volts for this particular screen. Um, but yeah, it does support different voltages for different screens and for bigger screens like, you know, 17 or 20 inches, you usually need a DC booster board. But for a little one like this, you don't have to worry about that. The other thing, of course, is the Perspex case. This is generally sold separately from the driver board. Um, so yeah, I'll link that down below as well. But yeah, it's just like a little clear acrylic case. And then finally, the LCD panel. So you'll notice the cable here actually runs into a different connector that runs into a PCB and then goes to the flat flex connector. So the cable I'll link is this cable here, which is designed to run into this PCB. I'm pretty sure it also comes with this PCB because yeah, it just needs to go through a bit of a conversion process to um, make it interface with this flat flex connector. And that's really about it. The only other thing you'll need is your own power supply. Um, like I said, I was running it off the DC power supply. I think it draws about 400 milliamps with this particular screen uh, off a DC power supply. But yeah, you can also run it off 5 volts, so about 1 amp at 5 volts. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers everything with this little setup. So yeah, like I said, I just use it for testing stuff, but I guess you could use it as a proper display or maybe even print up a case so it's all neat and tidy, but it it's average with 240p and lag is also average. So I don't know, your mileage may vary. So, as always, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. A massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. And if you want to do the same, links are down below. You'll get ad-free early access. And I also release some little patron-exclusive things every now and then. So um, check that out if you're interested. But until next time, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Oh, and if you have any other questions about this setup, um, yeah, feel free to ask in the comments. Bye. The lag is very hard to get used to. <laughs> oh, come on. Yep. <laughs>